welcome to the Ashes into Beauty podcast with your host, Stephanie Marie Laswell, Divorce Concierge at The Divorce Life. Hello, listeners. Thank you for tuning in today. I am excited that you are here. I have my friend, Shell. She is going to like, she does so many things, but we're going to focus on what she does as a family law attorney and how she works with divorcees to get through the process. And, you know, she's a huge advocate for making sure the kids are getting through it safely. And, but she's also what I love, an advocate for marriage. (laughs) We share that even though we are both in the divorce field. We are huge advocates for marriage. So thank you so much for being here, Shell. And with that, I'll let you introduce us or introduce yourself to our listeners. Well, thank you for the invitation, Stephanie. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. I have been a family law attorney for the past 30 years. My office is in Oklahoma City. I work at the surrounding areas. And in the capacity of being a family law attorney, I've had the opportunity to represent women, men, and children through the process. I teach, I'm an adjunct professor at OCU Law School. I've been doing that for about 20 years, teaching family law. And most recently, I revived a course that I had taught 15 years ago, the past couple of years, I've been teaching ADR in family law, which is alternative dispute resolutions. Becoming more and more popular. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Ways to stay out of court, ways to get through the process without the litigation, without having the judge be the one who decides how things are going to turn out. So that's life number one. That's what we're here to talk about. But my alternative (laughs) life, because that's that can be pretty intense is I write with humor about aging. I have a website called Fat Bottom 50s Get Fierce, a lot of fun, mm-hmm. and have a couple books awesome. that are based for that audience. Yeah. So that's my alternative, kind of get happy. Yeah, <laughs> to kind of lighten the load. A like little you, bit, yeah. You need a little to balance levity. it out, right? Exactly. <laughs> that's awesome. So what kind of sets you apart from... I mean, I kind of mentioned a little bit, but what do you feel like sets, you, sets yourself apart from your competition? I think there's two things that differentiate me between you know a lot of the other attorneys that I interact with. One is that I am the divorce lawyer who doesn't like divorce. Mm-hmm. And I've been misquoted to state, oh, she hates divorce. And that's what's in my social media. No, 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 I don't like it. I, I think that it's, uh, unfortunately, it is a necessary um entity that we have to explore sometimes for some people, but it's not happy. I really, to hear better a good divorce than a bad marriage, I I don't like that expression. I don't think it serves anybody well. I don't think divorce is a good thing. It may be a necessary thing, but um, I, I, it's not a happy event, regardless of how how necessary it is. Mm -hmm. So that's number one. And number two is I've had the opportunity to represent children. Mm -hmm. So I have a broader perspective than maybe some who haven't had that opportunity to see things from the children's perspective and how it affects them, as well as the mothers and the fathers. So it's hard not to keep that perspective in mind when I'm dealing with the parents. Yeah. Yeah. So let's dive into that a little bit since you touched on it. So what are you seeing that is taking place in the kids' lives as they're going through a divorce with their parents? Their worlds are being disrupted. Mm -hmm. And the main thing that I have seen is that kids don't want their parents to get divorced. Mm -hmm. They do not care that they're not happy. They do not care Mm -hmm. that they want to explore other avenues. They just know their world's being broken up. Mm -hmm. And as a guardian ad litem, sometimes I have to deal with that and and not, it's not my job. They have counselors. It's not my job to fix them or give them therapy, but have to, have to do with those comments. But when they can have that, and most of the time, that's not really an option. Their biggest desire is that their parents not bicker, gripe, scream, yell at each other. They don't want to be in the middle of that. They don't want to be the carriers of messages. Mm-hmm. And then, and often they feel that burden. They feel like it's somehow their fault if they, I hear, oh, he's doing great in school. He's managing fine. Well, just because he's doing great in school doesn't mean he's okay. It, it means sometimes that he's got control of that little portion of his world because the rest of it's spinning out of control. 
that would be the main message I'd want to get across is, is please don't use the children as a confidant. That is, go to another adult. Let them be kids as much as we can. And we may get to some resources later in the show, but that's, that's the biggest impact of seeing how their parents talk and treat each other mm -hmm. can make or break how they get through that. Yes, that parent alienation is huge and so damaging for kiddos. It is. And, and but even sometimes when it's not deliberate, when they're not intending to buddy up and side against the other, just expressing their sadness over and over when it's time for the child to go visit the other parent. You know, you get to come back in four days. I actually saw somebody that had a countdown calendar in their suitcase. Right. How many days they could cross off before they got to return to the other parent. And that's, that's not helpful for yeah. them. Yeah. And it's probably sometimes innocent. Like parents don't realize like those small things can make a big impact that does weigh heavy on the kids. Right. Yes. They're so in so much pain often themselves that sometimes it's just an unawareness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so to have an opportunity to help them see through their children's eyes mm -hmm. can be a positive outcome to, to some of my interaction. Right. And that goes back to how the parents choose to go through their divorce journey. And this amicable divorce process is seems to be becoming more and more popular. But not only that, it seems like judges are sending people back to mediation. Once, sometimes if they step foot in the court, they're being told, go to mediation and figure this out on your own. Can you talk a little bit about how that's kind of shifting and changing those changes that you're seeing? Mediation is mandatory in, by, from some judges. And mediation is the for those that may not be familiar with it, is where the parties sit down with a third party facilitator to work through and help them try and come to an agreement regarding their matters versus a judge just making a decision. But it is, it's not somebody who can make a decision. So it's still up to the parties to try and reach a decision. And it depends where they are in the process and how open they are to that, whether or not that's going to be successful. I have seen people go to mediation that really didn't want to be there and came in with a chip on their shoulder and it ended well and they got a resolution that was as good as could be under the circumstances, better than what would have happened with the judge because the judge doesn't know these people. He doesn't know their families. We get in front of him and or her and we have a limited amount of time and the skill of the attorney plays into how things turn out. So mediation can be a really nice option if people go in open to trying to settle. Sometimes that's not possible either because they're so far apart in their positions or maybe one is not receptive to it and is not cooperative. But sometimes what we have is one party who's been very well prepared, have been thinking about this, and I know you've addressed this in, in some of your writings and on other shows, one party's been planning this for a while, and, and so they have transitioned, and, and their response is, why can't the other side just be reasonable? Let's be mature and amicable. And the other side's still shell-shocked. Right. They're just trying to hang on, and maybe they aren't at a place where they can be reasonable and amicable because they haven't worked through the process like the other one has, which is unfortunate because it could be a very reasonable person just in a bad situation, and sometimes that can be used against them a little yeah. bit. Yeah. Divorce makes us do crazy things, but we're not necessarily crazy. It says our brain has shut off. That logical part is shut off as a protection mode. And so we show up different and we're not able to make those good logical decisions. And that's why it's so important to have good skilled people on your team as you're going through the divorce to help you kind of navigate all of that because it's next to impossible to do if you're on your own. I, I agree. It's, it's a form of grief. It's, it goes through stages and it can be overwhelming and it does affect rational and, lo and logical thinking. And there's, there's so many layers of loss involved. It's, it's not just the loss of this particular relationship. It's the loss of what marriage looked like to them. And they're dividing their stuff. They're things that they had worked together. You know, they had a vision of what that was going to look like. And now we're dividing the stuff and where the kids are going to stay. And it's, 
it's trying on a lot of levels and not just the actual divorce component of, oh, I'm not going to be married anymore. This right. person is wanting to, to leave me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They're, that I think that was probably the most shocking thing to me was the grief cycle and how it just comes back and it slaps you in the face. Like you think you're over it. Yeah. And then a year later, something happens and you're, you're faced with something and you're getting punched in the gut by grief again. Yeah. <laughs> like it just, it just keeps going on no matter how hard you work at healing. Um, it, it's crazy. It's insane. I actually had a friend one time tell me that she had been a widow and she had been a divorcee. And the grief process was much harder on the divorce that she went through than losing a spouse. That like shocked me. And if you're sharing a child, like you're having to adjust and what does this now look like? I have, I've got to figure out this whole co-parenting thing with a person that used to be my person, but it's not my person anymore. <laughs> yeah. And, and widowhood is not personal. There, there's not a failing there. Mm -hmm. In divorce, sometimes the person receives, what did I do wrong? Or what bad choice did I make? Or even if I I didn't do anything wrong, why am I be being affected by the other side's choice? And like you just said, the continued having to interact if there's children, it's, it's right in front of you all the time. Yeah, yeah. It's crazy. Divorce is crazy. That's why I'm like, try to work on your marriage. Like, do the things that you need to do to put in the work. It, a good marriage, a good healthy marriage doesn't just happen because you said I do. It doesn't. I have a little bit of different perspective on the work and I understand how people mean that to really put in the effort. And But I like to kind of reframe that. And this is the, the pro-marriage part. I didn't mention yeah, that at the beginning, but as you said, we're marriage advocates too. And one of the things I do outside of my divorce practice is speak and write about staying out of my office, ways to stay out of my office. And and one of the things that I suggest is stop talking about what you do to improve your marriage as working at it, because that kind of has a negative connotation, like, okay, I've got my job done today, check the box, I worked, I, I fit in date night, and whoop, check the box, I've, I've worked hard again this week. And, and call it prioritizing the marriage yeah. because when we were dating and trying to impress each other, we didn't consider that work. And every bit as much effort was put in that yeah. as what we're asking to, to put in the marriage and, and probably more at that stage yeah. because they didn't know who you were. So you had to show and impress. Mm -hmm. And But no, prioritize and look forward to, I get to spend some time here. And I think sometimes the words we use affect our actions. Absolutely. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And I love how you've rephrased that. Um, it sometimes baffles me that people think that, well, if it's meant to be and we're, you know, soulmates or whatever, then it should be easy. Yeah, nothing good <laughs> is easy. You know, if you want to keep anything, it, you look at the hobbies and, and the friendships, what we do to keep them fresh, we keep learning something new, we try a different place. And same thing with our marriage. If we want to keep it fresh and new and interesting, we look for opportunities to do that. And a lot of it comes back to embracing what we have, being grateful for what we have, and focusing more on what we have than what we want. Right. So when somebody's going through the divorce process, what is your biggest tip for family and friends to kind of embrace them as they're going through that? in a way that is respectful and, and loving. For outsiders that I interact with, I suggest they don't ask deeply personal questions. The, the person can share what they want, but so often I hear people automatically goes, is there someone else involved? None of our business. Mm -hmm. But I think the biggest thing that I offer to families as, you know, as I'm, I interact, especially as a guardian ad litem, I interact with all the parties, the grandparents and teachers and coaches and, and extended family, but also representing the mother or the father, you're dealing with their family and friends as potential witnesses, get the, the whole story. And they think sometimes that they're really supporting the party by hating the ex too, and really jumping in there with the dislike and kind of fueling that already anger, disdain. 
pain, grief that the person who's about to have an ex has already. And that's, it's not helpful. It's not productive. The party doesn't need it. I will tell them sometimes, encourage your friend or sister or brother or, or whoever the divorcing party is to see a counselor because them confiding to their loved ones isn't the objective feedback sometimes they need about getting through it. That is great to have a great support system. We need that. You need friends, family that understand spiritually, emotionally. You want people praying for you. All that's great from the people who love you. But it's also helpful to get outside the people who love you and get some objective input with regard to navigating your feelings and maybe getting some tools to how to deal and interact with this person who maybe you do hate their guts right now on the other side. Even without children, I think that's very important to try and stay emotionally healthy through the process, but even more important with children because you have to have an outlet to figure out what to do with your own hurt and resentment and pain, whatever else you're going through. Maybe joy and jubilation. Maybe maybe you're happy about it because this yeah. needs to happen, but it still needs to be tempered so that your kids aren't getting a negative about the other parent. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I would add to that. Your divorce is not what your loved one's divorce is. Each divorce has a different story, has a different process that it needs to go through. It has a different outcome. There are so many variables. Like how you divorced 20 years ago is going to look different than divorcing now. I'm so glad you said that. I'm so glad you said that because we get that so often. They're talking to people and they're just sharing their story and they're getting so much advice. Some maybe they're asking for and some they're not. But they are comparing themselves and their situations to maybe what's happening in another county or what happened with a different judge or what happened in a different decade. And and it's just, it's not helpful. And it's hard to sometimes get over that obstacle of their expectations Mm -hmm. based on what others have told them. Or somebody who's had a horribly negative experience who feels the need to share all their details and, and ramp up their their grief and nerves and not helpful. No, not at all. So it, it does matter. Um, and it does take a team to get through a divorce and it matters who you hire. It matters who you seek counsel from and all of those things, but maybe not your family and friends that are not the professionals. <laughs> let the professionals do the job and let your family and friends be there for you in that way. Yeah. Your support, your support system. Yeah, absolutely. So after, the divorce process is done. Um, kind of what is the beauty that you see as an outcome of working with clients? Some of the, the problems that we have during the process is maybe they're blaming themselves, feeling like a failure if they had done something different. The beauty on the other side of that is sometimes they have gotten through the process and realized they can own whatever part they had, but they can't own the whole picture. It just, yeah, Yeah. it's just not theirs to have. And sometimes it it takes a while to get through that. I also see people enter the process having no understanding about their finances or where to get the information because the other partner did 100% of that. Sometimes it's because they just each did their own area of expertise and one was doing kids and one was doing checkbooks. And sometimes it's because there was a controller in the marriage and they wanted to shield the other person so that whatever, whatever the reason for not having an understanding of that, it can be very empowering to get on the other side and realize if you thought you weren't the capable one that you are and can be, or if you just let it go because that was convenience how important it is to really have an awareness and an understanding going forward. So that's that's another positive that I see people coming out with. Absolutely. Like I can do this on my own and I have been able to figure out more than what I thought I could. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Um, what resources are out there locally that you know of that you would recommend people check out? If people have children. I, and we're in the Oklahoma mm-hmm. City area, Com Waters is a great yes. program and they have a, a program for just for the kids. They, ha- they have programs for parents for after 
divorce, parenting after divorce. In Oklahoma, you have to have a four-hour parenting after divorce class to kind of get parents hopefully on the same page as to how their kids are affected by their interactions. But they have another class. And, and step back a little bit. Calm Water started as a grief program. Charlotte Lankard started that as someone who had lost and could appreciate that. And over the years, they came to understand that divorce has the same grief process. So it expanded to cover divorcing people who are divorcing and kids of divorce. And they have, I think it's a six week course where kids can go once a week and it's not therapy. It is basically a support group for kids. They're, they're in a group with their own age. And it's, I think it's really helpful because it helps them understand it's not their fault. Number one, which they often don't verbalize, but Mm -hmm. they believe it. And number two, that there's other people going through it. Mm -hmm. I've learned fairly recently that schools now have a version of this. So for for those out there that don't have access to a a specialized program like that, you might, you might check your children's Mm -hmm. school and see what's available Mm -hmm. for parents who, one of the biggest problems we have is how parents interact and speak to each other. Sometimes they're taking their baggage post-divorce with them, their attitudes, and there's, different programs that assist in working and communicating better after divorce. Again, you have to be open to it. There's, we we are getting some orders from the judges, but there's a new program, I believe it's called Co-Parenting Solutions. Pretty new, has a couple of counselors who are running it. It's about a year old and it sounds like they're getting some good results. It's more expanded than the Parenting After Divorce. It's really working on specific aspects of communicating and um, another thing we have, I I really feel strongly about parents interacting if they're at all able so that their kids see you don't have to like each other. You don't have to be buddies. It doesn't have to be kumbaya. Let's all be at the same parties together. Although if you can be at the same parties, that's that's not bad for your kids. But to be able to be in the same room, for your kids to be able to see you being respectful to each other, I think super important. And Judge Davis from um He was in Canadian County for a while and then moved, the name is escaping me of the county he moved over to. But he said something, he talked to my class and said something that I will never forget the visual image of. And he was a family law practitioner in his little town. And then he became a judge. And so he would go sometimes and watch the high school graduations because he knew some of the kids from being in the little town and having worked with their parents. And he said one of the hardest things to see is a student as the biggest day of their life, they're graduating and they look out in the audience. And if their parents, their mom and their stepdad and their stepmom and their dad are clustered close together, whether they like each other or not, they go right there and continue the celebration. And for those whose parents are still holding that grudge and are sitting on opposite sides of the auditorium, the kid stands there and looks back and forth and has to make a decision which place to go. And he said, and some of them just came to me because they didn't have to make a a decision. So that, that visual of a kid's having to make a decision of what parent to choose at a time when it should be about them and celebrating, I think is, is a, an impactful image that I hope no kid has to ever actually experience for themselves. Yeah. My first divorce was seven years ago and my 15 year old recently came to me and said, mom, I'm glad you and dad get along because he has a friend that that's not the case. And so he's watching that play out in a friend's life and how she's having to deal with her parents not getting along. And so he's like, it just makes it so much better. Yeah. Yeah. So like, well, we did something right. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that's a big right. It, you know, for your child to be able to process that and and know that you guys made that effort and it was all worth it because they're worth it. Yeah. I think changes the tra- trajectory of their relationships. Oh, absolutely. And um, just having respect for another human, whether yes. you like them or not, being respectful um, is a is something we should be doing, right? Um, so whatever you have to do in your head. <laughs> to make exactly. that to make that right um 
and kind of step up to the plate because the children see themselves in each of you. Yeah. And so when we're bad mouthing them or, you know, not acting kindly or spreading rumors or telling our kids too much information that they don't need to know about, then they see themselves in that conversation. Yeah. Yeah. And another aspect of that kind of divisiveness, which isn't productive, is if the kids know that you're at odds, they can manipulate and play that game, play over here and and pitch you against each other. And it's so important to be able to, whether, again, whether you guys like each other or not, to have a unified front for the kids so that they don't have the ability to jerk everybody around and... Yeah, kids are smart. They are smart. <laughs> and it's younger than you think how, how quickly they catch up with, yeah. oh, this works over here. Oh, that's this will get mom riled at him and I can get away with this. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So what would you like for our listeners to take away from that maybe we haven't talked about yet? I think the biggest things, it's for those who are going through the process, Find an attorney, it may be even before, if you're even thinking about it, get with an attorney, get a consultation, understand your rights, understand what the process is and what it looks like. I think unrealistic expectations are one of the biggest problems we have. Either they have unrealistic expectations because they have gotten info from somebody who had a different experience, or they think because there may be the mom, custody is going to automatically go to them because they hear that's the, or the dad thinks, why try? Because custody does go to the mom. That's changing. That's evolving. There is really a more joint custody mindset in our court systems. And it's more about making sure the kids have both parents. So I would want somebody to have as much information as possible. I also want them to know all attorneys are not created equal there can be a good attorney out there that's just not a good fit for you. So don't don't hesitate to talk to a couple of different people, three or four, until you find a good fit. Communication is so key. One of the things that the people, individuals getting divorced bring to the table is they know, they don't know the law, they don't know how it works necessarily, but they know their story, they know their history, they know their family. And the family law attorney knows the law, but doesn't have that piece of the puzzle. So go in expecting to be a team. And if you have somebody that you're a little intimidated by as an attorney and don't want to ask them questions or challenge them in a respectful way, of course, um, it's probably not a good fit. Again, doesn't reflect whether or not they're a good attorney. May be a good attorney, may not be a good attorney, but it's just as relevant whether or not it's a good fit. Understand there's so much outside of our control the attorney's control, your control as someone going through the process. But one thing you can control is your attitude and who you surround yourself with and what you listen to. So I think it's really important at that time to try and, and get some positive people in your life. If, you have, if you're faith-based, get your little prayer team together. And it doesn't mean you have to share every detail with people, but you can tell them when you're having a struggle have some people in place. And afterwards, sometimes we have the illusion that once we sign on the on the lines, once we get that, quote, final decree, that it'll be better and, and we'll get to settle in. And as you've lived and shared with your listeners, the process isn't over, especially if you have children. And sometimes people forget that just because you don't have children, it still hurts yeah. a year later. Yeah. So to have realistic expectations, have a support system in place if you can. And be kind to yourself during the process. Mm -hmm. Find some little moments that you can put some joy in the picture, whether it's a hobby you enjoy or somebody you enjoy. Kind of plan, plan for those moments to make this process less difficult. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And once you get that final decree, execute it. Yeah. <laughs> it's not going to execute itself. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, uh, what, I think one of the things that sometimes people on the outside don't really understand is a grieving parent who now has to share their child with another parent. 
And so we hear things early on like, oh, enjoy your weekend off. You're going to love that. You know, you'll have time to yourself. Too soon, sometimes people back off. That's not what we presume we know what they're feeling or we want to help them get through it faster by giving them these little helpful things. Come on, shake it off. Get out there. Let's go have some fun. But what I would say, having said that, is if you have a friend who now has to share custody of their child, that might be a time that they could use a little extra tender, loving care. You you know, give them a call, check in on those weekends, maybe that they're feeling lonely. They may get to the point where they're like, yeah, I get to read all weekend. Woohoo. But that may not be the starting point. And it may not be the point two years in. They may still be hurting about Yeah, and the financial devastation is real. They might not have the financial means to keep up with the lifestyle that you're used to them, you know, buddying up with. Like they might not. That's a good point. Yes. There's embarrassment. There's shame. Like I can't go have girls night every weekend anymore. I can't afford it. I, you know, I can't do the golfing thing with the buddies because I've got child support now and alimony and, you know, so there's a lot of things that is shifting in their life. And if you can just continue to show up as their friend and adjust to those transitions with them without getting butt hurt over it yeah. because they can't show up <laughs> like yeah. they used to. Yeah, that's an excellent point. And it's an opportunity to be creative. There are a lot of things to do that don't cost money and are mindful. And sometimes you do have to move on. Sometimes there are maybe, you know, we had a party or and that's not appropriate anymore. And maybe, yeah. maybe that does need to move on. But I think a hardship that some divorcees have is they're like cut out of the social circle because they're not part of a couple. And that can be navigated around. I mean, we have friends that have gotten divorced and we still put the invite out. Yeah. You know, if they want to come both, if just one wants to come, we try and be mindful if it's mm-hmm. people who are in still in high conflict. But you can still be friends mm-hmm. with someone who's not married. The, the marital status should not change the relationship. Yeah of friendships and, and family. Um, there's too much loss going on. So keep chasing after that person until they get through on the other side. It takes about three, three years for somebody to recover completely and get back to a norm after divorce. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, uh, even if they're maybe not responsive, but a note, a text, Mm -hmm you know, a prayer, a funny little something in the mail, like the real mail, the mail that they (laughs) open their mailbox and there's like something with a Mm -hmm. bright yellow envelope. I think that helps just knowing that people still care. One of the best gifts that I've received from my girlfriends when I was going through it is flowers on my front porch at Valentine's Day. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So that's just a small little gesture, like you're still loved, you know. And so that that really brightened my Valentine's Day. So Yeah, I like that. Just be thoughtful and mindful of the shifts that are happening. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for being here. Of course, we're going to have all of your information in the show notes so people will know how to reach out and get a hold of you and all your venues that you've got going on. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. And thank you listeners for tuning in to another episode. Until next time, radiate love. For more information on services or divorce resources provided by The Divorce Life, you can follow me on Facebook or Instagram or find us at www.thedivorcelife.com. Thank you for tuning in and listening and a big thanks to my producer, Jazz, at the Possibilities Podcast Center.